Okay, <clears throat> so now it's uh, 10 30 here in uh, Brazil and we 2 30 in Sweden. So uh, <clears throat> I think we're ready to start our webinar now on uh, health and life science. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar on uh, health and life science hosted by Vinova. We are very happy to have representatives from a broad spectrum from both uh, our innovation systems. And <clears throat> this is a third of four webinars about our bilateral uh, cooperation. Yesterday and earlier today, we had uh, webinars on smart cities and bioeconomy. And later today, we will have a webinar also on uh, sustainable mining. Uh, this webinar is a part of our dialogue, dialogue with our common action plan, which have been developed during this a year between the Minister of Science and Technology and Innovation in Brazil and our Swedish <clears throat> Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. So thank you for joining us and taking part of this uh, exciting new way forward. And uh, please also visit, visit our homepage sbii.org for more information about our collaboration. Uh, and you can also join our LinkedIn group, Sweden Brazil Innovation Initiative. And some uh, practical information. <clears throat> uh, this webinar is intended to be around 75 minutes and question can be to the speakers can be asked in the Q&A and we will try to answer those after the panel discussion and else we will answer them after the webinar if we don't have time to answer all the questions. And then now I would like to introduce uh, our moderator for this session, Eva Carbonier. Eva Carbonier is the portfolio manager of the National Scalable Solution for Health as at Strategic Innovation Program Sri Life. And uh, Eber will talk about system transformation where the focus is on uh, preventive measures and projects where data and uh, computer power are used to predict and prevent. So please, Eber, the word is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob, and, and welcome everyone to, to our session here, Health and Mission-Oriented mission Innovation. And um, I will do a presentation, so I will put on my presentation and I will also present our speakers. So we do it that way and then that. And can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Good. So we um, we have this uh, health and mission oriented innovation and I will talk about uh, system transformation, but I'm very happy to have a group here with me where we will also have a discussion and panel. So we have uh, Louise Messina from Ruta RNP and I will introduce you further when you speak. And we also have Isis Amer Volin from RISE. And we have Marco Bego from Innova HC. And we have Peter Schell from RISE. And after those presentations, we will have a discussion and questions taken from the chat where Regina Summers will give us those questions. And after that, we have the pleasure of having the summing up from uh, Jose Gontijo from SEMPI and MCTI. So to start off with, just like Jacob said here, that we usually spend a lot of our resources on trying to fix health when it's already gone wrong. And a very simple root cause analysis shows us that investing in early stages would be more beneficial and why not profitable as well because uh, it's, it's actually the same thing in many countries that we only invest three percent in preventive measures and therefore we put 97 percent on the risk and ill part so if we look at it from a healthy risk ill perspective we sort of try to fix it when it's already have happened and Therefore, we can look at what affects health then. Why, why do we do it like this? It seems very strange because lifestyle affects health with 40% and family history and genetics affects health by 30%. And then environmental and social factors affect health by 20% and 
healthcare, and this is of course from New England Journal of Medicine, unfortunately only affects health by 10 to 20 percent. So it's very strange that we spend basically 90, 95 percent on that part. So we really have to um, discuss further with the Nobel Committee that we have to put more incentives, um, uh, payer models and business models and definitely incentives to invest in early stages because it's more beneficial. So this system transformation has led us to starting more projects. Of course, we have many projects in my portfolio within precision medicine and we work hard with the data and the prediction and prevention there too. But we have started this prevention of childhood obesity to do it really right from the start since it's really about preventing them diabetes type 2, heart and cardiovascular diseases and cancer. And of course, if you can prevent 30 to 40 percent of the cancers, it's worth doing it right from the start. And we go on um, talking to the Nobel Committee there so that we really do this system transformation. And we in Sweden have this problem with childhood obesity. And unfortunately, we are not alone at all in, in the world having this problem with childhood obesity. And from a value chain, it would be very strange not to do anything about this because of suffering and, and really costs. And for example, US spends 9.3% of their GDP on obesity, the, the consequences of obesity. So, so really this thing of investing and doing the prediction and prevention instead of just diagnosis and treatment is what we are doing in this system transformation. So we are working with this child. Uh, one of the projects in my portfolio is this large national project with 24 actors working together on the 10 year national mission, zero obesity at school start at 2030. And what I would like to invite um, our dear Brazil friends uh, as well is that we do this with worldwide companies as well. For example, SAS Institute, Microsoft, Intel, and we do a hackathon. So that could also be something that could be done in Brazil. So thank you very much. A short introduction. And I really look forward to hearing Luis Messina now. And um, there, so we can make Luis that you share your slides now while I introduce you, Luis. Yes. And uh, we have the pleasure of having Luis, who is the Brazilian National Coordinator of Telemedicine University Network, RUTE, at the National Research and Education Network, RMP. And Luis is also the president of the Brazilian Telemedicine and Telehealth Association, ABTMS. So, Please, Luis, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And thank you to our Ministry of Science and Technology for the invitation. You know, our, our broad um, focus is on, on digital health building capacity, but also improving collaborative research and remote assistance to achieve the universal health coverage. And of course, regarding the, S the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal. And when we talk about the SDGs, our main objective is to continue our work on collaborative networks that we have been building. And that's uh, all about what we are going to talk about. No? Uh, our national research and education has the attribution to, to give connectivity to all our research and our research and education institutions in Brazil. So there's a national backbone also connected uh, internationally. And, uh, and then we started building metropolitan community networks uh, to support the user organizations directly and also building the collaborative networks through 
the connectivity and advanced services. Just to give an example, this is one of our 39 uh, collaborative uh, metropolitan networks, this one in Manaus, connecting all the institutions around. I'm not going into the taste. This is fiber optics and fiber optics all over the country where we can. Of course, uh, in majority of the municipalities, this is still very difficult. And this is why the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation and our Ministry of Health have now a project to bring connectivity to the health family units. Um, started thinking of 15,000, but then 5,000 around already have uh, connections, good connections, so that we have already connected 7%, uh, 1,200 around. And this is a big effort. So RNP, our NREN coordinates, but has the telecom and smaller uh, connectivity firms in the interior of the country connecting uh, these uh, health family units. And then the national telehealth public policy in Brazil takes into consideration mainly the program Telehealth Brazil Networks, the Open Health University UNASUS, and the Telemedicine University Network RUCHI. And these three are the ones that have a, a bright and wide geographically distributed uh, collaborative networks. And so we are now under the Telemedicine University Network with 139 university and teaching hospitals and in these uh, 14 years we have been working and uh, with the volunteers professors uh, <clears throat> uh, professional health professionals building these special interest groups for example human milk bank that has already achieved an international status in latin america and caribbean the portuguese speaking countries but also the BRICS. so bringing better concepts of how to uh, collect uh, milk and have uh, organized milk banks to serve the child that are not receiving uh, milk directly from their mother. Uh, child, child uh, health and adolescent. So this is a big worry also in Brazil. And this is one of our uh, largest group. As you can see, we have every day in, in medium and average three sessions every day. And this is, has uh, expanded very much. And when started the pandemic, we created the COVID group and uh, with three sessions every week and 100 to 130 prof health professionals participating with the speakers from 14 countries besides uh, in Brazil. And uh, we have also a special interest group in obesity. So one of the perspectives that we could have is to, to link this child and adolescent health with the special interest group in obesity. But this belongs also to another uh, network, collaborative network, which is the sovereignty, sovereignty, security, food and nutrition, as you can see. The states in Brazil or provinces uh, like uh, Minas Gerais that had already started um, remote assistance in 2005 have expanded very much and achieved all the almost all the 850 municipalities of the state and giving second opinions largely to 3,000 every day on electrocardiograms, uh, <clears throat> evitating that 80% uh, of the telepatients uh, should be transferred. They, they can stay and have uh, uh, more, their um, evolution uh, monitored. And this saves also a lot of uh, budget from the municipal uh, health uh, secretary. More than 4 million tele-electrocardiograms in second uh, opinion. Also this uh, in, in exam, image exams and teledermatology in other uh, states and also ophthalmology and so on. During the pandemic, everybody started working with whatever they had at hand. And uh, just to take one very uh, 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 far uh, possibility in the state of Amazonas, the federal university starting assistance in remote education in many spe specialties and uh, uh, a large number of uh, 
have family agents. So this is going on, like in the state of Espírito Santo, wherever I am, the chronic patients were being attended or are still being attended at home. Uh, they had agenda and could not come to the hospitals. Uh, we assumed the new directory of the Brazilian Association for Telemedicine and Telehealth, and we are uh, working very hard having panels and uh, relationship with all the professionals in health we've had with uh, uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy, nursing, uh, phonoaudiology, medicine, of course, and the next will be with the pharmacy. So on uh, the 26th and exactly also on the 26th of November, we will have the parliamentar front on telehealth being launched by Deputada Adriana Ventura, Congresso Nacional at nine o'clock on November. November 26. And regarding the international collaborations and um, articulations, we are very well intensively working with mainly India and Russia. Uh, regarding uh, digital health, but also with China and South Africa. But, uh, but we did not achieve the status of, uh, of working group as we did with the Portuguese speaking countries here, as we also have now the first uh, fiber optics cable between Africa and the Americas connecting Luanda in Angola and Fortaleza in, um, here in the state of Ceará. So the, the, the minister signed a commitment and creating the permanent working group on telemedicine. And this is going on. Mozambique has already launched their national telehealth program. Uh, Angola not yet, uh, they have many initiatives, but Cabo Verde has and Brazil and Portugal. In Latin America, we had a, a, an IADB project and also this expanded now since first September to an expansion of RUCHI, the Telemedicine University Network, in accordance to these five uh, national research and education networks, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Ecuador. This is on the way we are constructing it right now. So this is what I wanted to present to you. And uh, so it is a, a big effort on the construction, sustainability, and evolution of collaborative networks, but we have a re, uh, already achieved some good results as we also contribute already to eight of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Luis. It's, uh, it's very impressive to see your work and how, how you have managed to really connect uh, and, and get these networks going and working. Thank you so much. And I will get back to you with some questions also a bit further in the session in, in the discussion. And our next uh, speaker, we're very pleased to have uh, Isis uh, Amer Volin from uh, RISE, the Research Institute of Sweden. And uh, Isis is a senior expert within digital health an MD PhD. So please, the, the screen is your ECS. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, can you all see my screen now? Yes, perfect. That's great. So uh, it's my pleasure to share some aspects related to uh, um, the, the major uh, challenge for sustainable development that we actually face. Uh, which are, of course, our uh, chronic disease. Uh, and uh, as previous speakers mentioned, obesity is an example. It costs uh, us in Sweden loads of money every year. It's also a risk factor for COVID-19. And as you can see in this slide, it's an increasing uh, problem uh, with age. So it's really something that has to be addressed very early. Uh, not only uh, the, the problem uh, we have in, in healthcare, if we wait until uh, the disease is a fact, as Ebba mentioned, is actually uh, an important contributor to carbon footprint. So uh, even if we do not really discuss this often, whatever we are doing in healthcare really, really affects uh, 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 both humans, but also the environment. And in these figures, we do not even uh, 
uh, often include pharmaceuticals and disinfection, which are uh, released with the water uh, in most countries. Uh, so we very much need to think in a new way. We need to re-engineer. Uh, we need to focus on prevention. And uh, this, of course, requires a completely different uh, perspective. Uh, this means we have to start teaching uh, uh, all uh, physicians about system science and uh, emphasize on, on things that are more focused on health rather than disease and diagnosis. So we need to embed prevention in both teaching, organization and practice of medicine uh, to get away from the economically unsustainable burden of disease. Uh, this, of course, means that we have to think in a new way, because uh, health is not just a product of uh, whatever happens today. Uh, Ebba mentioned uh, uh, many of the factors uh, and, and how they impact health. So health is actually something uh, that is built every day and maybe even uh, generations earlier. For example, we know today that the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, the human gut my microbiota has a, uh, a substantial impact on, on health in, in many ways. We also know that whatever genetic factors we, we uh, uh, carry can, of course, uh, 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 load us with different sus susceptibilities, but we can also shift them if we have the right environment. This is the whole uh, uh, depth of epigenetics. So what we thought 20 years ago was something we could not uh, uh, have any impact on. Today we know that it, there's a, a very important work uh, to do and that that work is mainly related to the inflammation going on. And we also know that our lifestyle is crucial, uh, that uh, uh, loads of publications, loads of knowledge has been developed over the years related to uh, uh, what we eat uh, and certain diets. So we actually have a lot, a lot of uh, knowledge related to how to change all the risk factors uh, for uh, for uh, to to prevent disease, of course, uh, we also have to to remember all the the factors related to the the surrounding of each human being. And I take this picture as an example because in Sweden we have a very uh, uh, for for many years we've had a big focus on maternity health which is probably the biggest social innovation we have uh, 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 developed and which has had a huge impact on, on health and, and uh, uh, life length of so many Swedes. Uh, of course, this is due to the fact that whatever happens in uterus affects four generations. Uh, and uh, whatever can be done thus during a pregnancy and after a pregnancy with a family is extremely important uh, to address uh, 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 a future with healthier individuals. Uh, and we have seen uh, several publications and several ongoing projects related to the, the digital possibilities in, in lifestyle changes, where we can actually uh, affect both brain health and, and general health by, by improving and, uh, and, and supporting lifestyle changes. Uh, a part of this is, of course, also trying to understand what are the effects of, of the, the various strategies that we, that we choose. Uh, and uh, looking, looking at, at how various activities perform uh, is of course nothing new, but with new technology and, and digital uh, uh, possibilities to analyze big data, we have uh, huge opportunities that, that uh, are, are new to us uh, today. So to summarize, uh, I'll just want to, to uh, mention the, the, the 
crucial parts, which are, of course, all the lifestyle aspects, but also uh, to remember that we, we should uh, use whatever technology we have to actually identify what value we provide. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isis, and um, excellent presentation. And, and on this uh, prediction and prevention perspective, and, and what you're saying as well, this with the gut microbiome and the, the microbiome as a whole in our bodies and in our surroundings, and also these possibilities of predicting what makes us ill and how do we keep healthy? And that is the whole idea as well, that why should we put our AI ML um, analysis and resources just on the ill part when there is a proportion from the OECD, a calculation that if we put one dollar or euro or whatever crown with one dollar on prevention we don't have to pay six on the ill part so it's quite a um, straightforward calculation but uh, we seem to still sort of hang on to our 200 year old uh, history here where we sort of uh, we come from the war times where the surgeon is still the the star so uh, we have to change that bit by bit absolutely Thank you so much, and we'll, we'll get back to more questions so uh, now we have the pleasure of having marco bego and um, marco is the chief innovation officer of the innova hc and executive director of the radiology institute hospital das clinicas of the university of sao paulo medical school so uh, please marco go ahead and welcome thank you Eva. thank you for having me are you sure my my screen yes perfect I think it's okay. Perfect. Uh, first of all, I'd like to 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 thank Gontijo and Minister of Science and Technology for always supporting the the Nova GAC projects and for inviting me for to participate in this panel. I'd like to thank the Swedish consulate and the great the other participants of this panel. I'll make a short presentation about uh, GAC and the Nova GAC and then present two examples of projects that are based on real and complex problems. The Innova GAC was built for the development of an innovation ecosystem in health. It is an open innovation program, which runs the innovation from, from, from outside to inside and from inside to outside of the, the Hospital das Clinicas. Uh, we focus on using innovation to solve complex problems and transfer scientific, technological, and cultural knowledge for the, to the system. Uh, Agassi is the largest hospital complex in Latin America. Uh, it has 75 years of activity, uh, eight specialized in institutes such as radiology, orthopedic, heart disease, cancer, and other. Uh, in, others. in addition, it has 66 research laboratories in the medical fields, and we with more than 200 researchers lines during in, nowadays. It has more than 20,000 employees, more than 2,500 2, beds, a six, 100, 106 operation room, and uh, more than 1.0 million outpatient visits per year. And uh, we have a rich database with more than five petabytes. Uh, at Nova GAC, we, we understand that innovation is not done alone. So the construction and the maintenance of an ecosystem has always been a decisive, decisive factor for, for success for us. 
this figure represents represents the mapping of the ecosystem where Novogatz is inserted, and this result the of a work that we did the, to organize our innovation projects in line with health needs and integrate with the government, the university, companies, the source of resources, and the, the, the civil society in general. Today, we have in actions that aim to strengthen each of these verticals here. Uh, Innovagas started the, the operation on a regular basis in 2018, it's, it's very young. And in the last two years, we, we have managed to connect more than 70 startups in our ecosystem. And we have collaboration agreements inside and outside Brazil and the projects with various specialty with publicly and private partners such as JS, Siemens, Deloitte and the Minister of Health, for example. And in some of projects, we public and private sector work together. Uh, our structure in, in RSA consists of a space for startups that we call an accelerator. Uh, inside the, the RSA, we have an, an artificial intelligence laboratory and support the areas with the auditorials and, and meeting rooms, the areas that we support us for the, the program. The accelerator is a joint project with a private company. And today we have installed inside RSA about 30 startups and many national and multinational companies that execute their innovation program, projects if, within RSC. And, uh, and uh, as an example, in this area, uh, AstraZeneca, which uh, has the Innovation Health Tech Laboratory of AstraZeneca is in this area inside the RSC. In this space we call, we also have the, what we call the Health Tech 4.0 experience which is a place to explore, test, and apply disruptive technologies together with our partners, with doctors, researchers, uh, students, and, and the public in, in general. The Artificial Intelligence Lab was built in a partnership between Agassi and Siemens in the first moment. Nowadays, we have more, more partners. And the Minister of Science and Technology helped us using the incentive law. In this area, we accelerate to use of AI in healthcare. Uh, the use of AI in health in Brazil is still small. Many companies and professionals still do not, ha do not have processes or how to use or buy AI-based products. And in this laboratory, we, we hope we, have, we will have actions to these experimentations. The structures of the lab are our data lake is a, a important data lake and our challenging and training platform that you call Orbia. Today in the in lab, it has projects in the area of lung, lung diseases, breast, cancer, and that's the, the, the main projects here. In, in addition to the thematic projects like this, in the innovation model of InnovRC, we maintain three general programs. One, the first one you know, uh, aimed at researchers who have a project that could become, a, could become a product or service with a social impact or, or for business. This, the, we have an, an incubator for startups in beginning, stage, in beginning stages of the operation, which aims to improve the MVP, prototype their, their, their projects and a, a good business plan and an accelerator, an acceleration program to help the startups um, scale their products or service from, from the market. And as an example of projects that we execute within InnovaGAC, in there are two that I would like to share with you. The first one is the use of AI for actions to fight against uh, COVID-19. It is a project that is aims to build a platform so that we could offer AI algorithm to assess the likelihood of positive COVID-19 and the involvement of the lung parenchyma due to illness. As Brazil is a huge country 
and we and with structural difference between the, the regions, our challenge was to choose or develop the best algorithm in, in the market at the moment to build a platform that regardless of uh, the local structure, um, uh, the hospital could use it, the service, which in which in these cases are were free. And here, here is, example, uh, is an example of how the platform was designed. Uh, the hospitals uh, send their, their exams to the, our cloud uh, system that receives the images, uh, anonymizes them, and send them to the, the AI algorithm. At, last, uh, at, at least five minutes, the algorithm returns the report and the images marked uh, with the area of the lung affected by the disease. These images uh, and the report returned to, are returned to the hostel of origin and are also stored in the project's data lake. We still have a, a set of experienced doctors to discuss the case and issue a, a second opinion if, is, if necessary. Uh, this platform started in operation on 4th of May. We spent 45 days until the first version, and the results so far are more than, more than 30,000 30, platform access. Uh, almost uh, 50 hostels are using the, the AR platform in all regions of, the, the Brazil, of Brazil. Almost uh, we have already analyzed almost 20,000 20, exams, and there are five algorithms work together in the, in the platform. Uh, in addition to the, 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 important, the importance of the, the treatment, this is also, it's also important that the, the, the results have been used to develop in methodology to use uh, AI and test the hypothesis. This is the, the website where we have more information about the, about the, pro, the projects. And finally, uh, I'd like to briefly introduce our digital health program. Uh, our idea is through the, the partnerships to develop uh, health projects. And with these use cases, understand uh, which governance model is most appropriate and uh, uh, if the regulation is adequate when faced with the reality, test the technologies by the marketing, for example, devices, and, and, and try and test the interoperability between the various systems and equipment, and help with uh, a proposal, because in Brazil it's, it's, uh, it's a, a problem, a proposal for public purchase purchase processing, and how to maintain economic sustainability inside the DHC. In addition, of course, uh, for, for us, is part of the, the universe, teaching and research, we focus on innovation and usability. And our projects that we be used as a, is a pilot for, from this, this, this program are in the area of bone marrow transplantation, and we choose this one because the, the, uh, this project covers everything from primary care, the hospital environment, and the chronic patient. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's my presentation. Thank you. And, and I hope I, I added to, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. And really, this uh, slide that you just showed now, this uh, typical uh, view of the patient journey where the patient has several applications that they have to use and log into and and that's not sustainable and and really really good with this um, work you're doing on the neural networking and and um, recognition there of the covid 19 on the on the lungs it's 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 very, very well done. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. We will get back with some further questions. Thank you. So uh, we have the pleasure of uh, now having uh, Peter Schell 
from uh, RISE, uh, Research Institute of Sweden. And Peter is uh, head of uh, digital health at uh, RISE. And the screen is yours, uh, Peter. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ebba. Uh, just give me a second. And I will share. Usually we would say the floor is yours, but now <laughs> it's the screen is yours. Let's see. Perfect. Is everything okay? Great. Um, I uh, had a little, little bit different uh, angling of my talk because I, I thought that Maybe, maybe we could be inspired by some of the possibilities, but also some of the challenges uh, that we have been facing and uh, experience this past year. And uh, that's hence the subtitle, Digital Health and the Involuntary Global Digital Health Pilot, that we actually were jumping straight into due to the COVID-19 situation. When it comes to digital health, there are so many parameters. It's a really complex system when it comes to data sharing, interoperability, usage, uh, interaction with patients, system of system technology, and so on and so forth. Uh, how we should interact with, with electronic health records, how we should utilize health data, how we should utilize IoT, et cetera, et cetera. We had really high hopes for digital health, but we also had a strategic plan. And as you know, the execution of a strategic plan is not always uh, how it end up in reality. And this was actually something that we, we have been experienced globally uh, during this year. Um, we have actually created great value and we have turbocharged the digital transformation and fast forward actually what we have achieved with digital tools. But doing things in a really fast manner makes it not as sound as we initially planned. And this is just because, I mean, you cannot fast forward something that was according to, to the strategic plans and, and research and development should be done in five years that we have in many places achieved in five months. So what we have today in healthcare is a great connectivity between different entities, between patients, between the clinics, etc. And everything is of course, depending on data flows. The data flows uh, in between uh, with great interoperability is the challenge in many parts of one of the first topics that I, I will uh, take up and discuss. And that is the digital infrastructure. What we have seen during this past year is a very strong need for a strong digital infrastructure. And this is not only that we need a good connectivity utilizing 4G and 5G to, to reach out in rural areas, but we need also a very high-end back-end system to take care of all the data streams and also to create platforms and APIs that are interoperable between different systems, between different organizations uh, on, on a national scale, but also how uh, um, companies with their devices can interact and create value with their innovations. And as we know, we have, this is actually an old picture. We are around 500,000 now uh, in 2020. Despite having these many applications connected to our phone, there is very few successful attempt actually to utilize applications for, uh, for uh, tracing of, of a COVID-19 disease, for example. So, so this is something to look into, even though that we have great digital possibilities, we need to do it in a very structural way. And that demands a good digital infrastructure both connectivity with fiber and 5G, but also with the software system and structure uh, of the back end. 
what we also realized is that fast forwarding uh, digital transformation, we often forgot the cybersecurity. Uh, even though we saw the possibility and we needed to implement them now because of, of, of the COVID-19 situation, we realized that some of the parts of the digital systems were not up to par when it comes to the security. And this is, of course, a really, really important question, especially when it comes to healthcare and healthcare data. I mean, this is the most sensitive data that we are sharing in society today. We have also seen a very strong trend and great opportunities when it comes to remote care. In Sweden, uh, digital health visits and video visits to, to MDs and uh, general GPs have increased in some parts of the country several thousands of percent and has created a possibility to, to, uh, to ease the burden of, on the physical care. Uh, so that transition went really smooth and gave a really strong impact, even though that the system in Sweden were not really up to par when it come, came to reimbursement uh, between different regions and municipalities. Uh, this has been challenging for the organizational structure. So this is also coming back to the digital infrastructure. If these kind of issues uh, can be implemented in a digital infrastructure, uh, a lot of uh, things are, are won. But we, what we also have seen during this year is a, a strong possibility to, to increase the pace of utilizing home, home monitoring and IoT especially for chronic patients. And uh, mentioned in, in the previous talks, we, we had some good examples for this. And, and uh, in, in Sweden, there has been quite a few very successful uh, projects that are scaling up now uh, this year um, for, uh, for um, chronic heart disease, for COPD, but also for other chronic diseases. So this is a very, very strong trend. And this also makes the possibility to reach out for rural areas and, and uh, less, uh, uh, not so densely populated areas uh, for support of, of chronically ill patients. What we also realized is that when we are pushing through a digital transformation of the healthcare sector, we tended to forget about UX and usability. Uh, pushing out with technology push, push uh, technologies uh, to achieve impact. Sometimes these technologies were, were, were not polished enough to create that impact. When utilizing digital tools in interaction with patients, for example, but even with, uh, with uh, the clinical side as well. And this has especially been true in the care sector uh, in the elderly care homes where the state of, of, of the training or the educational level for on digital tools has, has been quite low. So this has been a quite strong challenge. And then the last point I want to pursue, and this is change management. And uh, Marco was, was uh, mentioning this in, in, in the ending of his talk that we cannot do analog things in a digital way. We need to utilize change management much more efficiently to have really the strong impact that, that we can achieve with, with digital tools. And this is not something that is done from one day to another. And this is uh, quite clear now when, when we have fast forward the digital transformation this year. With this, I ended my challenge uh, part uh, of my talk. Uh, I will mention a few slides uh, about my organization before I end. So um, I come from Research Institutes of Sweden and we are one of the, or the uh, Innovation Institutes of Sweden. And we are publicly owned uh, and we are in the value chain of innovation between academia and industry and the public sector. So we are doing a lot of project with the public sector and also creating value for industry. We are the one-stop shop when it comes to helping companies 
with R&D projects that are usually not within their own R&D department. When they want to utilize technologies, maybe that in another domain. And since we are a quite large research institute, we are working in all major branches of Sweden. So uh, everything from mining to forestry, and uh, as you have seen, we are, we are part of many of the webinars uh, today with the different topics. And digitalization and health and life science is, of course, a strong focus for us. Uh, we are around 3,000 employees. Uh, we are running around 6,300 projects a year uh, and are running 126 test beds. And this is everything from test bed coupled to, to healthcare and life science uh, to mining, forestry, and, and large uh, uh, ICT test beds for smart cities. One of those ones that I want to pursue uh, is the cyber range. Uh, we are, have a state-of-the-art cyber range where you can actually test out uh, your systems and see if they are up to par with the cybersecurity frameworks. And we are part of the European cybersecurity ecosystem, uh, Concordia, and we are doing this uh, in coordination with Ericsson uh, as a major part. Uh, we are also heavily involved in the Swedish AI agenda, uh, and this is we are doing uh, together with both the public sector, the industry, and this is also together with Vinova. And as you have mentioned before, AI is, of course, uh, a key technology for digitalization of healthcare, even though we need to find uh, the right uh, subdomains that we can uh, um, utilize this in much more precise in the future. We also are having a test and demo uh, uh, when it comes to big data and handling and backend structure. Uh, we have in this uh, test and demo, we have 64,000 compute computational cores and around 20 petabytes of storage to test out uh, uh, big data and uh, distributed AI solutions. And this is something that we have in-house. With that, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Peter. And of course, the, the cybersecurity part is uh, highly relevant for, for all of us. And um, you are working on this ice computing power, but of course, if, if we get the quantum computers going, we, we are all in a, bit of a, in a bit of a challenging time. So since the HTTP, HTTPS, the secure will sort of pop away. Uh, and maybe it already has, not, not that we know of, but maybe there are, uh, nations that that uh, might have already gotten more than 53 qubits or 54 qubits uh, going so so we will see maybe it is like with the cybersecurity maybe it is like with uh, for example the the Turing work with Bletchley Park the enigma that uh, they didn't tell that they could break the codes until 20 years after so uh, that uh, that's that it's good that you work on that, Peter. Thank you so much. And um, now I would like um, our panelists and ECs to come on too. And um, we will have a, a discussion session. So um, I will uh, start by, uh, I would like to hear more here from um, Louise. Um, Thank you very much for your, your great presentation. And, and one of the questions is uh, some of the potential health collaborations between Sweden and, and Brazil, uh, what are your ideas on, on how could they be best performed regarding these networks that, that you have worked so excellently with? 
Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think the, the, the first steps we could choose to go on is to, well, first decide what areas would be on the interest of the Swedish side. Uh, at the Telemedicine University uh, Network and the Nutrisan, we have uh, many special interest groups that would be uh, willing also to share their experience and move forwards, for example, uh, child and adolescent health, uh, obesity, um, uh, in intelligent, artificial intelligence and data science, uh, health education and uh, collaborative medical education, um, digital health also. And so in, in all these fields, there are around at the moment, maybe 75 groups, which are very active. They have at least one session every month, but some of them have already three sessions every month. So uh, it would be very um, easy for us to get these uh, health professionals and specialists together with uh, interested groups from, from Sweden and then go from there. And share some learnings and, and experiences and models and, and also the, the data models and, and the IT systems. Yeah, that would exactly. Be very exactly. And, uh, and there are also, as uh, Marco pointed out with startups and so on, uh, and also Peter Schall, uh, there, there is a, an, also an initiative uh, discussing with our technological parks, w which uh, have many um, startups and, and new small companies that are starting. So this could also be connected on in, in a second uh, possibility, but uh, it is also on the way. That's, that's very good, uh, Luis. Thank you very much for those, uh, those suggestions. And we will take that to the, to the notes as well. And, and, and then also on, on those um, uh, with small and medium sized enterprise potentials and collaborations, are, what are your thoughts on the scientific contents and knowledge domains? Are there any, does it go together with this or do you have further ideas on what scientific contents and knowledge domains would, would we exchange further or is it in line with this uh, that you have mentioned? Well, I'm not going to get into detail exactly because I'm not I'm not a specialist in all these 70 or 75 special interest groups. Uh, what maybe I would like to to give us an uh, uh, also as a question is uh, I don't know how this is running in the, for example regarding obesity and uh, the impact of internet in the students or in the pupils in the uh, primary schools. Uh, I've seen. The, we have many, many, I, I just took a look here and there are probably around 5,000 primary schools in Sweden. And um, are they receiving some sort of, uh, of orientation in respect to obesity and, uh, and impact of internet uh, abuse and abuse? And maybe we could, um, uh, start some conversation in this point of view, as long as we have already this pandemic that is pushing everybody into working in um, ICTs. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going into um, health spe specific details. I leave this for the uh, real specialists in the fields. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Luis, but uh, you've really got the point there since uh, if we don't do anything about this. It's a bit of a quiet pandemic. COVID is a very, um, <laughs> we hear more, very much about COVID, of course, and it's very real. But of course, this, this obesity pandemic is sort of a quiet uh, pandemic that we don't seem to do enough about since this uh, ratio of putting in $1 and then you don't have to pay $6. It's, it's quite an easy equation. Um, yeah, well, you know, we, as I said, in March, we started this COVID group 
and um, uh, we're still we are still running this COVID group. Last Monday we have uh, a speaker from Gavi from Geneva talking about vaccines. Uh, Fio Cruz in Brazil is very much involved as Butantan and others. Um, so, and, and in many, if you like, dermatology, cardiology, urology, urology, pediatrics, and, and so on and so forth, coloproctology, uh, indigenous yeah. health. And these are all groups very active under the Telemedicine University Network and would be delighted to have a, a collaborative network with Sweden especially perfect thank you so much uh, Luis for for those uh, comments um, and if we uh, reflect a bit uh, Isis well, what are your thoughts here on on potential collaborations and I thought also that your views here with the system science perspective perspective is very very interesting um, what what areas do you do you have any thoughts on specific uh, potential collaborations that you you would be interested in uh, well first of all uh, the system perspective is uh, as i mentioned a, a shift so it needs to start uh, already from medical school um, which could be a possibility to to uh, 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 arrange uh, courses or, or collaborations uh, in relation to the me medical curriculum uh, because the, the, the shift needs to be done everywhere and I think we have uh, uh, it, it, it's very valuable with, with different perspectives internationally to, uh, to address uh, a curriculum which is I think all over very uh, traditional and old fashioned. Mm. Uh, related to possible other uh, projects, I think that uh, the one I, I mentioned related to maternity care is extremely important because it's, uh, as I said, crucial to, to long term health that you start very early. Um, whatever is is uh, happens in a positive way uh, when the during pregnancy will affect several uh, generations, uh, and we have seen uh, a positive um, uh, uh, experience in in uh, uh, distant uh, uh, consultations in maternity care, which could maybe be. Uh, a possibility where where we could uh, uh, address both the organizational part uh, and how pregnancies are are uh, um, supported in, in our two countries uh, and and maybe share some experiences. Thank you. It's a really good idea, Sam. And uh, I, I can imagine that uh, quite a few of us would be very interested in trying to transform the medical schools uh, with much more prediction prevention and not only diagnosis and treatment and with the help and also to, to really educate, like you're saying, Isis, then on, on digital health uh, to, to use the, the tools. And also what you're pointing out on the maternal side, because of course that is doing it even more right from the start uh, when the, the pair is having a, a, a child because there is also a, a willingness to change at that stage. So uh, that's, that's very, very good uh, comments, Isis, and, and uh, we will take that to, to the notes as well as potential collaborations. That's excellent. And um, um, Marco, um, how is it um, your your innovation program at Innova AC or HC is is like you have have um, presented it? It's very it's broad and it's fantastic. Um, what what kind of priorities in this broad spectrum would you like to see within Innova HC? Thank you, Eva. Uh, uh, our program is started in the first moment. You need to, to, 
to, ra to rise né? because the, you need to enter in the other areas because the, the program is very young. But uh, today we choose some, some areas to, to pre prioritize. The first one is, is the artificial intelligence because it's, 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 you, you have a lot of data, but it's not, we're not to totally organized nowadays. And we try to organize our data lake and after the day, the machine learning is, is, a, is a good point to, to us and a, a priority, a priority is, a, is one of, of our prior, priority. The, the program of the digital health uh, that you call hospital 4.0 technologies because you, you try to use the IoT like uh, in wearable, invisible, kind like that, test this, this, this device because uh, some of them don't work well in, in our country because the, the distances and the, the infrastructure and the digital health is, is one of them. We have another vertical in robotic surgery and 3D print, it's, it's work together. And uh, we try in the next year, uh, organize our, our laboratories when you work in biotechnology, like biosense or biomaterial and, and genetics, guys like that. Mm -hmm. And as, as, as Peter said, I think, he, uh, we have a problem because we are using a lot of data in this in these projects and connect areas from inside and outside of the city. And it, just just for curiosity, we suffer every day ten thousand attacks of uh, hackers and kinds like that in our systems. Yeah. <laughs> That is really interesting, Marco. And, and now with this uh, COVID-19 situation, of course, there are so many attacks on hospitals because uh, at least uh, there are in Sweden and not everything is known either because of course you don't want to tell much about that you are attacked and, and how you try to handle it. So that is, uh, that is really something. Peter, we have to work on the cyber security there. And just uh, one more question, Marco, then uh, those are the priorities within the Innova HC and, and are there any specific areas where you would like to see collaborations or where you would be interested in, in seeing collaborations, uh, Marco, with, with Sweden Brazil? Hospital uh, das uh, Clínicas is a, is a huge uh, hospital complex. No? Uh, and link it to the university. And here we have four pillars, uh, assistance, um, teaching, research, and the, the innovation area that connect all of them. So I, I believe we don't, we don't have, a, we have a lot of options to, 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 to collaborate and to work together. But I think is uh, we can, if, for example, startups and Swedish companies can join with us to develop and development uh, projects or test this project in, in Brazil, in, in our system. It's, it's a good idea. I, I know that the university just have the agreement with the Karolinska Institutes. I know that professors here work together with, the, with the yours. And I think because we are a hospital, uh, our we we will we like projects that solve uh, try to solve real problems. That's our our first first uh, first thought that uh, uh, we start to uh, uh, collaborate agreement. That's our idea to choose choose the, choose the problem to solve, and after that, I think the 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 way is, is more easier is easier than the in the first. That's one. perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. And uh, before we take uh, Peter, uh, Regina, how is it? Do we have any questions from the audience to any of our panelists? Yes, we have a question here uh, from Peter Beistan. Would child health and strategies to combat childhood obesity be one aspect to connect Brazil and Sweden? And also from Peter, uh, also in relation to COVID with its consequences uh, for subjects with obesity. Could this be one prioritized era in the, in the 
connections and the collaborations between our countries. Now that we have action plans heading the way. Any any thoughts? Maybe Jose or uh, Luis. Uh, any thoughts on that uh, or Marco? What what are your thoughts? We we all in Sweden we have a large project uh, regarding prevention of childhood obesity. So so uh, just like you say, Luis, uh, you you are on that area as well. What what are your thoughts? Yes, uh, we have many specialists in the network which are uh, also recognized internationally, and uh, and so they they have fluency in the in the speech and in the scientific uh, international approach, and therefore uh, it would be relatively easy to to bring these persons together, and then plan. Uh, not as a plan that Peter Schall showed us, because uh, I agree with you, Peter Schall, but, but it is the, uh, necessary anyway to have these plans and then yeah. follow them. And definitely, like Isis is saying, the, the, the parental side is, is, can be part of it, because that's really doing it right from the start. So that's also, thank you very much, Peter Bergsten, for, for that question. Um, anything else, uh, Regina? Not right now, not right now. Okay, then we take uh, some comments and thoughts, uh, Peter. Um, I, I, I really think uh, your part there, cybersecurity is, is uh, crucial for our, our individual and patient data. Do you have any comments or thoughts further on that? Well, um, I, I think it's a really important topic, of course. Uh, that's why, why I picked it, both as a challenge, but also as an opportunity for us to co collaborate uh, around. Uh, because I, I think in a context as we are in now, in between Sweden and Brazil, we can learn from each other, we can disseminate knowledge. Uh, we can also, on the level of research and development, have a more neutral stance because cybersecurity needs to be uh, it needs to be stated uh, from that neutral stance. Even though we have companies that uh, sell solutions that mm -hmm. are promising uh, really strong security solutions, we need to be knowledgeable about the cybersecurity actually to be able to also to procure systems that have the right level of security and also that we are knowledgeable about the technology um, how that technology will fit into this domain because it's a really complex domain and and often um, security solutions are applied and and just transferred from other domains and branches uh, of, of industry and we need to think about how healthcare data is uh, treated or handled compared to other types of, of, of data. Even though it's a lot of things to be uh, taught or, or learned from other branches to, to, to make this switch faster, but we need to take into consideration the, the, the special mm -hmm. uh, framework that, that, that we have around healthcare data. So yes. Thank you very much. Very good uh, point to, to end off with, with the health uh, data. And uh, uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Jose to, to sum our, our session up here. And um, the, the, the screen and the floor and everything is yours, Jose. Well, good morning, Mr. Svenska Vanne. That's like this. Ah, it? <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Bo bom dia, but it's not. It's not a good morning anymore for you. But bom dia. Um, uh, bom dia can be used uh, even in the afternoon here. No problem. Oh, perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, the presentations was were very very good. I guess you get lots of insights. And thinking about trying to merge what everyone told. Maybe you can get the Huchi network for RNP that Messina said. And with this, this approach that you have uh, and is this tell regarding the prevention prediction 
and use together both to get these 70 institutions that Ms. Luis Mencina mentioned to how we can improve this network to, to, to approach this, uh, uh, maybe a huge program in Brazil for childhood obesity and using the technologies inside the, uh, the uh, Innova HC in Sao Paulo with Marco Biego, as he has mentioned, he's a, a huge uh, um, a hospital, huge open platform laboratory for health experiments. So we can use them as some kind of focal point for some specific project. Maybe we can do some kind of joint calls, such as the same that we did with European Union. We have, inclu inclu uh, we have a, a, a obesity project for childhood together with European community. I don't remember which country is involved, but I, I can trigger this and send to you later. And, and also we have to think about uh, the cybersecurity, Peter. I guess not only cybersecurity, we have also to think about GPR and LGPD, that's the, the Brazilian GPR, and how we can do all those things together to for sharing information, not only between uh, the institutions engaged in the project, but some kind of uh, database, some kind of library that all the startups could use this information to training their solutions for the, the health systems. Uh, Marco has a huge database, the, the, the HUCHI, the network for the telemedicine uh, network in Brazil, has also a huge database. How we can uh, arrange that with anonymization, with the, 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 the correct uh, protection measures for cybersecurity, security by design, so developing solutions, security by design, to, to, to give the confidence for the people that they can use and receive the best quality of service. I guess, I guess this could summarize what we discussed today. Of course, it's a, it's a little bit generic yet, but I guess if we can do some kind of for test force, bring it, you, know, you, you four that participate in this panel, trying to bring some specific projects, I guess we can choose one, maybe getting all those those approaches, one project and push it. Then maybe we can have a very interesting project between our countries. I guess that's it, Eva. Thank you. Well, that's an excellent uh, summary and, and good uh, getting it together so that we have a next step. We just get going on this. Thank you so much, Jose. And uh, back to Jacob. Well, thank you very much. I would like to, to thank you, Vinoa, for arranging this uh, webinar and, uh, of course, our panelists for this very valuable uh, conversation and discussion we had had. It's very a uh, foundation for our further collaboration in this bilateral collaboration between Sweden and Brazil. And I would also like to, to thank you all the attendees who have been participating here. And uh, if there's any question we have not answered, we will try to do that uh, later. And also for more information about our bi bilateral cooperation, you should go into our homepage, the sbii.org, and you can find a lot more information to follow this cooperation. So once again, thank you very much.